Good morning, church. How are you all, sorry, y'all, uh, doing today? <laughs> Uh, for the first time in my life, I have to admit now that I am the one that talks screen. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, the special music. Uh, brings back memories. Uh, I was a horn player myself in band, uh, so you know that was very enjoyable. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Pastor Tabor for the invitation to speak today. Um, I've enjoyed getting to know the Nudd family over the last six months, and want to wish them well uh, in the new calling in Chattanooga, along with Heather, Owen, and Callan. Well, if any of you are like me, I find a speaker more engaging if I know a little more of their background. So to break the ice, this is just a brief overview of how I have traveled through life to end up at this pulpit today. I grew up knowing the Adventist Church. Uh, both my parents had been active members in their respective churches at some point in their life, and my grandparents were also practicing Adventists. Uh, my family left the church for personal reasons while I was still very young, so for a period of time I was not regularly attending. Uh, but despite what we have argued as the age of reasoning or age of accountability, as a small boy, I still had the influence of the Spirit. Uh, for example, I always felt out of place when someone turned on Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, when, I was, when I was about eight or nine, my mom, brother, and I returned uh, to church with my aunt, uncle, and cousin. Uh, my father, while respectful of the decision, wanted absolutely no part of it. Uh, I attended public schools for uh, all of my elementary studies. Uh, later attended an Adventist Academy for middle school, and finally a Baptist school for high school. Uh, while I had the choice to go to Wisconsin Academy, uh, I wanted to stay home to play sports. Uh, so in high school, I played varsity soccer and basketball for four years. Uh, I made my decision early on that I was not going to, uh, I was not going to play, but pray on Sabbath. Uh, there was some flack for that uh, from time to time, but I persevered and later was recognized as the most inspirational player, not for my play on the court, but my influence and dedication to my faith. Uh, you never know where your testimony will serve uh, and where your mission field will be. Uh, my father, who was still not in the church, was serving as assistant coach on our basketball team. My decision to not play or practice on Sabbath kept him uh, honest in that he did not participate as well on uh, did not participate as well, and this testimony eventually led my father back to church. Uh, I graduated high school in 2001 and was baptized uh, in a lake at Camp Wakanda at the Wisconsin Conference Camp Meeting uh, that summer, along with my brother and two cousins. Uh, following graduation, I attended the University of Wisconsin, where I graduated with a degree in business management and accounting. I met my wife, Connie, while working at my last job and married her in 2007, and we were blessed with our twin children, uh, Jeremiah and Emma, uh, who were born in September of 2010. Now, at this point, I was a homeowner. I had a family and two kids and was 16 years into my career on a path leading me to a higher management position. Uh, possibly even in sunny Southern California, which was a place I had always wanted to live. I had seemingly met the definition of the American dream. Uh, Carpe diem, seize the day. Uh, but God said, as Elder Reed put it last week, steady, steady. Uh, God revealed to my wife about a year ago that he would soon be moving us, even so much as to visu visually show her in dreams, vivid dreams, uh, revealing pine trees and red dirt. Uh, which we all know are staples of the South. <laughs> and I, like a caring and understanding husband, told her that she was crazy. I am a man. I do not move on feelings or emotions. I needed indisputable, irrefutable signs that God wanted us somewhere else, and that was something I simply had not seen. Uh, during this time, uh, the uh, during this time, the tolerable corporate conditions of my job began to deteriorate. My stress level went through the roof, and my career was growing stagnant at a dead end. But in September of 2013, I had a potential job opportunity come up to work for a competitor down here in the South. A competitor that was smaller in size, privately owned, and had always been revered as the enemy. Uh, Connie and I flew down with the rest of my family and met with the owners for an interview. Uh, the interview eventually turned into a job offer and relocation package for not only myself, but for my father, mother, brother, wife, and sister-in-law. That is simply unheard of. I heard the calling loud and clear, 
as God spoke to my entire family <clears throat> to move us here to Gainesville, and here we are. I love my job again and have enjoyed our transition into the heart of the South. God is good. I was told many years ago that I would be a preacher one day. I was even asked to serve as an elder in training uh, to groom you to speak. Uh, but being overwhelmed with work and college studies, I did not feel that fire. I did not feel that calling yet. But God works in mysterious ways. I didn't receive my training within the church, but rather through public speaking, PowerPoint homework assignments, and giving business presentations in college, the same activities that I was too busy with to prepare myself to speak in church. As for his calling, well, he calls us when he knows we will listen. For me, it was not during the day when my mind is cluttered with work. It was when I was sleeping and my mind was clear. God woke me up at 1.30 in the morning to deliver this message to my church in Wisconsin, which I'm going to share with you today. Who here is a fan of science? Uh, my two favorite subjects in school were math and science. I had always enjoyed them because there was always a systematic way of approaching things, and in the end, the equation was either right or wrong. Whether right or wrong, the path always led, uh, the path was always black or white. If the conclusion did not turn out the way I had anticipated, I would either test it again accept, or accept the results. If the testing was performed correctly, there was no questioning that the data was accurate. Man developed a specific method to test things uh, such as gravity, motion, and thermodynamics. The method used observations uh, and research to prove a theory, and if it's fail-proof time after time, we call it a law. But who made the laws of science? God did. Is it possible to use the scientific method to prove other laws that are not necessarily physical laws, but doctrinal laws? Today we will see, and let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for this uh, beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, Lord, uh, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Put me in the shadow of your cross, Lord, as I uh, pray this message, Lord, that it is you speaking and not me. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. First off, uh, in order to use the scientific method, we must understand it. The method uses seven steps to systematically observe and reason a specific question. The question we need, uh, the first step that we need, is to define the question. The title of today's sermon is Sabbath, Tithing Your Time. The question I posed was, does tithing directly relate to the Sabbath? From that question, we must uh, move to the second step, which is to uh, gather information and resources. Then we must uh, form our hypothesis. What exactly is a hypothesis and how does it work? Uh, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines it as an assumption or concession made for the sake of argument. The most common form of this is used like this. Hypothetical situation. Let's say that the Atlanta Braves, or my Milwaukee Brewers, are playing the Chicago Cubs in the World Series uh, this October. For one thing, this could not happen because they both play in the National League. Uh, and another, while well, the Cubs need a telescope to see first place from where they're currently at. <laughs> but does this matter? No. Uh, this is done for the sake of argument, and I can make up any scenario that I want to, no matter how far-fetched. We generally see this form prominently used at the end of football season over playoff scenarios. Uh, the second part is an interpretation of practical situation or condition as a ground for action. Being as that we are in church today, do you think relating Sabbath with tithe is practical? Uh, the second part of the definition is a tentative assumption made in order to draw out and test its logical or empirical consequences. An empirical is relying on the uh, experience or observation rather than due regard to system and theory. I know I can be guilty of following beliefs because my church says it's true or my pastor tells me I should, but rarely do I take it upon myself to prove it in a systematic uh, way. Uh, once we have defined our hypothesis, we need to uh, test the hypothesis through experiments and collect data. From this experiment, our main resource is the Bible. But how can you make an argument to science without some observation and statistics? I have a few studies that I found very interesting. 
Uh, from there, we're going to analyze our data. We're going to interpret the data and, uh, and either confirm our hypothesis or draw conclusions to start a new hypothesis. And the final step is to publish the results, in which this case is my sermon. Uh, to perk your interest, I'm going to skip a step and go right to my hypothesis. As we said before, the question posed, does Sabbath directly relate to tithing? Without having any data, I stated, by keeping the seventh-day Sabbath from even to even, or sunset to sunset, we are tithing exactly 10% of our time given us during the week, where one divided by seven is equal to 10%. I see some strange looks coming from the audience. I want to preface that my hypo the hypothesis is a tool to test your assumption, but you can also use the hypothesis to prove something is incorrect. By that conclusion, uh, is a few steps down the line, so let's continue. In order to do this properly, uh, we need to gather some information to explain the content of our hypothesis, in this case, the Sabbath and tithe. The Sabbath is defined uh, by man in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. We are all familiar with the first definition. The seventh day of the week observed from Friday evening to Saturday evening is a day of rest and worship by Jews and some Christians. Sunday observed uh, among Christians as a day of rest and worship. The part B must be researched from the source, uh, that being the largest congregation of Sunday observers. Uh, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Sabbath is defined as the Sabbath or seventh day in which God rested after the work uh, of the six days of creation was completed, as recounted in the opening narrative of the Bible. Creation is thus ordered to the Sabbath the day to be kept holy to praise and worship God. Just as the seventh day uh, or Sabbath completes the first day of creation, so the eighth day, Sunday, the day of the week in which Jesus rose from the dead, is celebrated as the holy day by Christians, the day on which the new creation began. Thus, the Christian observance of Sunday fulfills the commandment to remember and keep holy the Sabbath day. Does this say, does this say, uh, Sunday is celebrated as a Sabbath day? No, it says that it is celebrated as the holy day. It also says Sunday keeping, uh, Sunday keeping fulfills the commandment, but it does not state that it takes place at the Sabbath. In fact, entry number 2175 says, Sunday is expressly distinguished from the Sabbath, which it follows chronologically every week. For Christians, its ceremonial observance replaces that of the Sabbath, in Christ's Passover, Sunday fulfills the spiritual truth of the Jewish Sabbath and announces man's eternal rest in God. But how does the Bible define the Sabbath? We need to uh, define the day which we saw referenced in the definition stated by the Catechism of the Catholic Church. From that, we'll turn to Genesis 2, verses 1 through 4. Thus, the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from his work which God had created and made. And uh, Leviticus 23:32, It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. We saw that God rested on the seventh day, and that he defined it from being evening to evening. Now we need to define tithe. Uh, first, we'll turn back to the dictionary. Uh, we are most accustomed to the first definition, where a tithe is a tenth part of something paid as a voluntary contribution. But we can also see that tithe simply means tenth. So what are we supposed to tithe? Deuteronomy 14, verses 22, uh, says, You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. Now, unless we are all farmers, we don't measure our increases by grain, but more as monetary gain. Uh, next, we move on to Leviticus 27, 30, verses 32. And the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or by the fruit of the tree, is the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And concerning uh, the tithe of the herd of the flock, whatever passes under the rod, one-tenth shall be holy to the Lord. Basically, whatever God blesses us with, we should give a tenth back to him. But other than the ability to make money, what does God give us? Uh, Exodus 20, verse 12. 
Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord is giving to you. God promises to give you long days. Uh, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached unto all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Is this past tense or future tense? This is set to happen in the future, so we are told here that we will have more time before the end, but don't confuse this with the urgency to get ready. John 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, uh, there you may be also. Again, we see future tense as Jesus said he will go to prepare and not did prepare, and will come again and not did come again. God has given us time on this earth to get ready and spread the gospel to the world. Now that we have defined the Sabbath, tithe, and time, we can go back to our hypothesis and perform a preliminary litmus test. Uh, we need to analyze in that can tithe be directly related to the Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath is a measurement of time. We saw earlier back in Leviticus that Sabbath is measured even to even, which is about 24 hours. Time is given by God and received by man. We are allowed by God the choice to freely use our time. Man is instructed to tithe on increases. Time is given by God and used by man. Time can be divided into tenths or tithes, just as we divide days into hours, hours into minutes, and minutes into seconds. Therefore, yes, we see that tithes can be related to the Sabbath, and our hypothesis is plausible. Now we test the hypothesis further. We know that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week and lasts from evening to evening. Now there are seven days in the week, and the Sabbath makes up 14.3%, which would be the math, one divided by seven. We also see that a tithe is 10%, but what is a hypothesis? By keeping the seventh day Sabbath from even to even, sunset to sunset, we are tithing exactly, not about, 10% of our time given us during the week, where one divided by seven is equal to 10%. By strict mathematical proof, we know that 14.3% does not equal 10%, just as two is not equal to five. However, we are measuring using mathematics of man and not of God. Let us digress for a minute and discuss our math versus God's math. Mathematics is a form of science used to solve an equation. For instance, when we add uh, two numbers together, we can solve an equation with the example that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. We also can add three numbers together, such as 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 3. To show uh, the figure in the previous slide, we can solve the equation that 1 divided by 7 is equal to 0.143, or 14.3%. But we have a tendency to be narrow-minded as we are not able to understand God's divinity and law. We can see this in uh, Genesis 2, verses 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and they shall become, how many? One flesh. 1 John 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these, how many? Three are one. So we can see in the first text that God defies our logic because according to Genesis, one man plus one woman is equal to one flesh. We can also see from 1 John 5 that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit are one. Who is the Word? Uh, John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, this is just a, another term for Jesus or the Son. So we see, according to God, one Father plus one uh, Son uh, plus one Holy Spirit is equal to one God. What is one divided by seven according to God? That is what we have yet to find out. Uh, but as you can see, our math and God's math did not equal the same outcome. Because of this, we have to convert God's measurements to be congruent with man. How long is a day to man? Uh, we measure it midnight to midnight, or 24 hours. How does God define a day? Genesis 1, 1 through 5 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. 
Uh, we also saw in Leviticus 23, verses 32, that it was measured evening to evening. So man uses the clock as a standard, while God uses the sun. How many days are in a week? Well, we know that a calendar shows seven days, and in the Bible it also outlines seven days. Now, how many days are in a year? Well, to man, it depends on the year. If we follow the Gregorian calendar, which goes off a four-year cycle, uh, each year is 365 days, with a fourth leap year adding an extra day. We have to add this day because the exact measurement of, the, of a year is not 365 days, or 366 days for that matter. For this, we need to use God's measurement, which is the solar year, which is about 365.25 uh, days. We can now uh, show this by using the Gregorian calendar and taking the average of the four years to come up with 365 and a quarter days. So the answer is that there is 365 and a quarter days in a year. But why the uneven number? Is this by accident? I would argue no. In order to figure out how tithe relates to the Sabbath, we need to find out how many hours are in a week. We can calculate this by taking 365 and a quarter days in a year, divided by 52 weeks in a year, and that is equal to 7.024 man days per week. Now remember, God's measurements are perfect. It is man's that are not exact. Uh, we can then take 7.024 and multiply that by 24 hours in a day, and that gives us 168.576 hours in a week when we convert man's unit of measures. Uh, as stated earlier, time is given by God and used freely by man, similar to money. So if we were to give back a tithe on our time that we were given, we would give back 16.9 hours. But what happens to the remaining 7.1 hours in the 24-hour day as the Sabbath? if it is kept from even to even. Here is where it gets interesting. In the Gallup poll taken in December 2001, 1,019 adults were asked multiple questions about sleep and stress. The data was completed and averaged, and, these, uh, and of those polls, those who frequently experienced a significant amount of stress slept an average of 6.3 hours per night. Uh, those who sometimes experienced a significant amount of stress slept an average of 6.8 hours of sleep per night. And those who rarely or never experienced a significant amount of stress slept an average of 7.1 hours per night. Now we do know that the Sabbath is about 24 hours. So if we deduct the 7.1 hours of sleep that our bodies need to rarely or never experience a significant amount of stress, we are left with the 16.9 hours, which is exactly 10% of the time given to us in a week, which means it would equal the average amount of time we are awake on the Sabbath day. But doesn't the doctor tell us that we need to sleep eight hours of sleep per night? According to uh, Dr. Daniel Kripke, the co-director of research at the Scripps Clinic Sleep Center in La Jolla, California, We've all been told you ought to sleep eight hours, but there was never any evidence. Now, if any of you are like me, you are telling yourselves that a thousand people surveyed is hardly, hardly a fair sample of 300 million Americans. I'm not here to play politics, so I wanted something more substantial. From 1982 to 1988, a six-year study of 1.1 million men and women took place for a cancer prevention study overseen by Dr. Kripke. Data was collected over six years, and the data was compiled and analyzed, and the results were very interesting. Uh, more ex excess mortality was associated with sleep durations of eight hours or more than in sleep of less than seven hours. This increased risk uh, exceeded 15% uh, to those reporting more than eight and a half hours of sleep, or less than three and a half, four and a half hours. The lowest mortality was experienced by men and women who reported sleeping in seven hours. The results of the larger study are congruent with the results shown in the smaller scale Gallup poll. Now, seven is no significance, and we can actually see this all over science. Uh, we just saw that in the studies that our bodies do not need 
uh, eight hours of sleep, but really only seven hours. Dr. Edward Cregan of the Mayo Clinic validates this uh, by stating that our bodies need one day in seven to rest to fight stress. According to the Stanford School of Medicine, our skin regenerates every seven days, and every cell in our body is replaced every seven years. God loves the number seven, and it is evident in the scientific observations of the secular world. Now interpreting the data. So in conclusion, by keeping the Sabbath while we're awake, we are tithing 10% of the time given to us per week. The remaining 4.3% passes without any realization as our body and mind is resting. While we are resting by definition, we are not knowingly observing, but we are knowingly observing the time we are awake on the Sabbath. The reason why we didn't, uh, why we wouldn't deduct the 49 hours we sleep from the total hours in a week to tithe is that we can freely use this time to do whatever we wish, but as stewards of our body given by God, it is up to us to make sure that we properly allocate this to rest. Therefore, keeping the Sabbath is indeed equal to a 10% tithe. Is God good or what? Uh, I do have one more seven in science that I can mention. Uh, we just proved our hypothesis in seven scientific steps. Uh, before I close with prayer, I just want to briefly touch on something I said in my introduction. Uh, standing up here is not easy. Uh, preparing yourself for a message is not easy. Volunteering to share a message is not easy. I never had to worry about that because the pastors and elders were the ones qualified to share the message. Well, God patiently groomed me on, this, uh, on his time using my choices to be able to speak to you today. I come to you not as an elder, but just as a deacon, uh, the blue-collar workers of the church. I thought being a deacon meant that I passed out handouts and took offering every now and again. So many times we get caught up into a title and overlook the gifts and testimony that God gave to us. God doesn't use titles and positions to spread his word, but he uses those that hear the calling and are willing. I would like to encourage anyone out there that if they're feeling uh, God leading them to share a message, uh, please talk to your, uh, your pastor or uh, one of the elders and let them know. Let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord, and we thank you for the Sabbath that you have set apart for us to rest. Uh, Lord, we uh, recognize, Lord, that uh, Tithing goes much farther than just monetary gains, Lord, but it also goes through uh, all the gifts and all the blessings that you give us. Lord, we just ask that as we go on throughout the Sabbath day, Lord, that uh, you would be near us, give us a special blessing. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.